Oh, we love a new project. We love a new job. We love a new job. Designation, XH558. <laughs> Name, the spirit of Great Britain. That's a lot of playing. This is the first time Guy's seen a Vulcan up close. Look at that. It's just massive. It's the size of the sky. 45 tonne as it sits here. 93 tonne when it's full of fuel. 14 fuel tanks in that, 14 fuel tanks. No, it's quite nearly, not quite, but nearly the speed of sound. It's like 700 odd mile an hour. That's a lot of plane noise. The Vulcan was a remarkable leap forward. The concept was dreamt up in 1947 by Roy Chadwick, whose other celebrated bomber, the Lancaster, entered service just five years earlier. Going from a Lancaster bomber to this in the space of five years is like nothing. It's like noise. It's nothing like. You could say, you might say that it's a quantum leap. I wouldn't use that word. I haven't thought of the word yet that I'd use. But this is just, oh, you know, one of those moments. <laughs> Who's that? I've come up with that. It's one of those moments. Look at it, hey? Handled like a fighter, but then could drop massive nuclear bombs. You need to have a look in it. Is there any light? Will this camera be able to see that? She's cosy. She's cosy, mate. Right. Yeah, what we've got here is, um, that's the pilot, number one pilot. That's the co-pilot. This is me on the stairs, and there is no space. You could not swing cats around in here. Here we have AEO, Air Electronics Officer. He looks after all the planes, electrical gummings, and there is a lot of electrics on this. Um, now, Plotter, he looks after where the plane's going. And here we have Nav Radar. He looks after dropping the bombs. See this in the corner? See that? Manual bomb dropper, eh? That is a powerful button. So you're thinking, right? One, two, three, four, five. Oh, and that's your, um, your suit warmer that took 90 minutes to warm. It recirculates the air in the engine bay to warm that up. 90 minutes! <sighs> You've broken me! You've broken me! But she is busy. I press the button. The only thing better than experiencing a Vulcan display from the ground is to watch it from the sky. The Blades aerobatic team have flown alongside 558 on numerous occasions and are marking this their final display together by inviting a Spitfire to join the formation. And Guy. All right, mate. He'll be flown by Miles Garland, one of the Red Arrow's youngest ever squadron leaders. Don't be shy, my mother wasn't. So what's the craziest thing you've done? What's the craziest thing I've done? Yeah. Um... Just seconds after takeoff, guys within a wingspan of the Vulcan. It's a bold statement, that, but I don't think there's anyone that's got any nearer to a flying Vulcan than, than me and Miles. I reckon I could have jumped onto the Vulcan like a bloody. You know, I just. I could have. I could, that's how close it was. It was going that slow, it looked like it was going to fall out of the sky. But it wasn't, it was doing 180 miles an hour. The Spitfire is 20 years older than the Vulcan, yet is still nowhere near retirement, which begs an obvious question. 
There's a load of Spitfires flying. Why can't the Vulcan carry on flying? She's not as simple as Amet. Because the Spitfire, it's cables, rods, linkages. You could build it in your shed. But the Vulcan could not be further from that. It has 14 miles of cabling, more than 100,000 parts, and with no manual overrides, if there's a system failure, it can't be glided to the ground. With the engineering firms who guarantee her safety now running out of the old-fashioned skills needed to support her, 558 has to be retired. Vulcan's going to accelerate away now, Guy. Might want to film it. Look at him go. Hey. <laughs> yeah, that's the flying with the Vulcan complete. Bad. Mega. Perfect, guys. Thank you very much. I'm probably the last person that's going to get as near as that to a flying Vulcan. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I know, Maxi. You've done that before. <laughs> Well, that's never going to happen again, is it? I've just all went to mush. I just, I just, I've just been sat the whole time, just gazing at the thing, <laughs> just gazing at it. I'm still shaking my head. You got to, you give me a minute. Give me a minute. I'm a cup of tea. 558 is fit to fly for now, but there's one safety aspect that has beleaguered the Vulcan through its entire life. Whilst the pilot and co-pilot up front had ejector seats, the design couldn't accommodate them for the crew in the back. Although there were no crashes during active service, there were several training accidents. It was so difficult to get out of the Vulcan if you had to in a hurry. There was some nasty accidents which involved pilots getting out and rear crew not getting out. I lost quite a few friends that way. If they'd had ejection seats, they would have survived. One of the first things we did was to say to our pilots, please guys, no mock heroics. If you've lost control of the aircraft, go. There's nothing you can do to help us, go. They didn't fit ejector seats to the rear crew, but what they did do for us is they, the seats would swivel and then we have what's known as a seat assister cushion. Right, I get into that position there. I pull this lever on the side which inflates that cushion there, like a whoopee cushion. And you cannot fight it. If it goes off, it ejects you towards the entrance hole. Because uh, there is a disadvantage that if you've got the undercarriage down, then just aft of the, uh, the escape hatch is the nose wheel. Um, that front wheels are staring at me. It's not going to do your dentures too much good. I've got to somehow get down there and jump that way while avoiding that, while trying to pull my parachute. You what? The way you had to go down then is you went down with your legs spread apart, so your feet slide down the outside of the hatch onto the hydraulic jacks, and then you reach over and catch the starboard jack. Starboard? Why side is starboard? And you swing yourself out the side of the door. Um, hang on, I've got my shield caught on there. Hopefully, to go down the side of the nose wheel. I'm got. And now, pull me parachute and try and miss that. Even if the nose wheel wasn't down, an emergency exit was perilously dangerous. Not terribly satisfactory, and not a lot of people have actually got out. 15 Vulcan crashes, all in all, um, and in 10 of those crashes, all of the boys coming out that way died. 10 of the crashes. Odds aren't very good. I can see why. One rear crew member who had to contemplate those odds was Peter West. I heard this bang. Well, it was a bird strike. The two starboard engines burst into flame, and for the first and only time in my RAF career of nearly 35 years, I pressed the key and sent a mayday message. The plane was 558, the Vulcan guy is working on. People have said to me, oh God, 508 nearly killed you. Con on the contrary, 558 kept us alive. That aircraft with a big hole in the starboard wing stayed airborne. 
Vulcan crews have always been considered amongst the elite. And next guy will discover if he's made of the same stuff as he's put in the cockpit and handed the control. Back in early 40s, you're going to work knowing that the Germans want to come over and bomb you. Eh? Not easy. A bit of pressure, isn't it? I don't think you just wouldn't let that get to you, would you? You'd be very British about it and you'd just get on with it. Keep calm and carry on, wouldn't you? You'd have to be, wouldn't you? Very British. I knew we might be bombed, but it didn't seem to bother me at all. I, I, I just loved it. I loved every bit of it. I loved the camaraderie. I loved it. It, it. it was beautiful. As part of the latest generation to work on a Spitfire, Guy clearly has a lot to live up to. Of course I'm up to the job, eh? All right, I'm willing to learn. I'm not going in there. There's no, I'm not going in there. I'm just trying, you know, of course I can do that. I don't know. I'm holding my hands up and saying, look, boys, I've never worked on a plane before. I've definitely never worked on a Spitfire before. You know, you need to, you know, point us in the right direction. But I'll give it me all. I'll give it my best shot. No question. Definitely, of course I can do it. Riveting a fuel tank is Guy's next job back at Duxford. The team are eight months into the N3200 project. These early Mark 1s, the fuel tank doesn't have a like a crash or bulletproof covering like the later versions, so it's even more important for it to be leak-proof. And that needs precision riveting. And like in Castle Bromwich, Guy will have to do this by hand rather than rely on a modern-day robot. If you're putting a rivet in a place of stress, like on the bottom of a fuel tank, you have to use these hardened rivets. But you can't rivet a hardened rivet up. So what you have to do, you have to heat it up to 485 degrees, and that then makes the rivet more malleable. You know, you can rivet it up then. The rivets, made of the same steel alloy as 75 years ago, are then frozen to preserve that malleable state. There are just two hours to use them before they harden. Nick Dean is in charge. What's the plan then now? We put some in? Yeah. Where do you want me? Right, so what yeah. we'll do, start from the middle and basically work outwards. Just bring it down gently. All right. Yeah. Yeah. A rivet is a quick way of permanently joining two pieces of metal together. Is that all right? Yeah, looks fine. The shaft is pushed through a hole and has its end flattened by a rivet squeezer, exerting a ton of force to fix it in place. This tank here is 37 gallons. And the tank that sits above it is 48 gallons. So what's that, 85 gallons altogether. <clears throat> when she was up in the air, she'd be using a gallon a minute. I mean, that is thirsty, isn't it? A gallon a minute. Yeah, that is some going. You could not tip it away faster, could you? Really? Could you? Well, if you're licking on, you've got enough fuel for an hour's worth of flying. So that's only half an hour there, half an hour back. Any more than an hour, and we're going to be in bother. Yeah. Now I'll get these rivets. Nick's been on this five weeds. I don't want to be knackering it up now. <laughs> My bloody riveting, it's not a bloody laughing matter, is it? <laughs> five weeks gone into this. It's finished. Exactly as it would have been done originally. The job's worth doing, it's worth doing well. Yeah, fair play. The Spitfire had enough fuel for around an hour's flight and enough bullets for 14 seconds of firing. Grand crews took great pride in how quickly they could perform a pit stop to refuel and rearm, even though they were targets for bombing themselves. Guy persuades some of his Duxford colleagues to see if they're a match. They say a team of four blokes could rearm a Spitfire. What was it 2,400 rounds in three and a half minutes? Yeah. Right. So get out of these boxes. Yeah. Scarper over there. How are you fixed? I'll see it go. <laughs> right, so we're going for it. Yeah. I'll just follow you, what you boys do. I don't really know what I'm doing. Okay. Already. Oh, it's starting now. It's starting to stop watching now. Go! Oh, I'm not much of a runner here. Don't no, overtake me. <laughs> <laughs> right, where do you want me? He's carrying a cow, he's quicker than me. Where do you want me? <laughs> First of all, you whip off that long panel. Yeah. Come on, guy! He's trying his best. I missed the screwdriver and scratched the pen. These boys will never forget it. I'll do this one. Okay. All right. Put that down there. Yeah. Hold the button. That's the used bullet, so they'll, they'll have just been spent on a lot of Germans. Okay. All right. With two of the three and a half minutes gone, they're only just threading the first ribbon to help guide the belt of bullets into the gut. Must have been difficult in those times to do what they were doing, quick turn rounds and yeah, looking up at the skies, thinking when are they coming over to drop bombs on you or yeah, brave people. Shut the lid. Like that. 
Yeah. Three minutes. That's three minutes. Hey, this is just putting the bullets in because you'd have another team cleaning all the breaches and the barrels as well. Yeah. Uh, there'll be other people okay. checking yeah. radios. Another one will be walking around to see if there's any damage on the aircraft. Ten, nine, eight, eight, seven, six, five, four. Pull it all through. Pull three, it through. Yeah. Two, one. Time's up. Oh, we'll just carry on then. Well, we're nowhere near done, but then we'll carry on. That's it. Okay. okay. Gun cocked. Is that us? Yeah, that's us. We'll panel up now. So that's taken us what? We've done two boxes in what, thick end of five minutes, I suppose. <laughs> and those boys were doing eight boxes in three and a half minutes. They were. I'd say it's impressive, but as impressive as that is, if that was your job, you would make sure you were the quickest in the world, wouldn't you? That's, yeah, yeah it's all about getting them back up in the air, wasn't it? Yeah, it's impressive, it's impressive. It is impressive. The plane is now ready for its most intricate parts, which will test Guy's engineering ability to the limit. The wings. This is... Spike, he's the wing team right, leader. Hello, Pleased to meet you, mate. How's it going? All right, yeah. all right mate. Hey. All, all right, right. what's the plan? Right, now, here we go. 1936 drawing. This is basically a, what we call a general assembled drawing. Yeah. Building a wing begins with the internal framework of supports called ribs. Each rib is handmade and must be strong enough to withstand the stresses of a Spitfire's 400 mile per hour dive. We're making What's that number five? rib five centre portion. Yes. You're forming that boom, which is called a top boom. Yeah. They start on the shrinker. In you go. That's sit. Now the Spitfire's responsive handling relied on the precise the curves yeah. of its wings. Mind your fingers. And here the bends of its frame are made by pulling the metal fractionally inwards. That's it, and just move it along every half inch or so. By doing that, that's gently curving that material. Without putting it under any stress. Without putting it under any stress. That's it. You see? Right, very subtle one. Very, very subtle. Bloody hell. When they put the beam on the layout board. Put that up there, like so. Spike's experienced yeah. eye spots a job look. Well, as I can see from You're this. You're a treat. From here. Yeah. To there. That's slightly over curved. Right, so it wants a bit taken okay, out. Okay, so that one a bit taken out now. All right. Yeah, that's fine. That's just undoing everything that was done over there. You can't. That's what you can't teach someone that, can you? Hey, just like it's, it's, how many years you've been? You that this thirty, sort of 50, 30 years. I've been years years in the game. Yeah. So the same on the bottom. Yeah. Just same on the bottom. If you don't get it right, it don't fly. Or even worse still, the wings could fall off or break up. There's no substituting for the correct fasteners and procedures. You do it right, or you don't do it at all. Basically, that's a goer. The first part is complete, but each rib can contain up to 20 different parts. To get to that there, I take a week, right? But in a whole Spitfire, there's 124 of them. Hey, it takes a week to make one. Hey, you can see we're going to be here a day or two, can't you? Hey, what do you reckon, Spy? What's next? One wing is made up of 3,000 different parts and each must marry up perfectly to the next. Once the ribs have been completed, the largest parts can be fitted. Right, where do you want me? The exterior skins. 250 pins are screwed in so the wing can be fine-tuned before it's permanently riveted. So yeah, the whole idea is getting this edge here to line up perfectly. You see it? Up there, that spot on there, isn't it? But up here, we've got a bit of a gap, and then it closes up back up there. It's taken off five times yesterday. It's been on and off five times today, and probably another five more times, just to get it, just to get it perfect. It's all perfect. It has to be perfect. No if spots on maybe it's perfect. Sometimes it can take forever. <laughs> it's just been a bit of a perfectionist on the side, I think, where you're just not happy until it is exactly right. You know, you need that little bit of mentality, I think. The repetition of the job is probably one of the hardest parts of it. So it's uh, very laborious, but it's got to be done right. The work continues. Back off again. Back off again. Unpinning, shaving, shaping, refitting, unpinning, shaving, and shaping again. A bit nervous. In 1940, it took just days to make a wing. Not today. A year per wing. A year per wing. So you don't get fed up with it? Not really. No? No. Do you? No, no, no. No? No, no. Good lads. It's finally perfect. Work of art. 
The section is then attached to the rest of the wing framework. It will take another six months' effort to complete. Guy's pilot will be vintage aviation specialist, Paul Ford. I think the exercise in some respects may be more difficult because we're not actually aiming to get something to hit a damn wall. We're actually aiming over the top of the wall, which we can't see. Contact. Contact. Operation Flower Drop can commence. OK, you happy? Yeah, go for your life on. The DIY dam busters position themselves at the start of the Derwent Valley. The dam lies ahead, and the target lies beyond. They descend to 60 feet above the water. Dam busters height. This is the right speed and the right height. <laughs> On the way. And what happened? We hit the wall. We couldn't have been further away. We was actually like 120 meters away. <laughs> so a bit later. We need to go a good bit later then. So we went round for another lap. We gets to the dam. Gets to the dam wall. He goes over that, and he sees like a lifetime, right? I can see the target X max the spot. I'll release him. Guess the radio through. They're in the trees. The bomb runs continue, but estimating a release point for an unsighted target combined with natural variations in wind, altitude, and speed, make getting a bullseye just as challenging today as it was in 1940. The early part of the Second World War, one in three bombers got within five mile of the target. One in three. I know we're talking, what, we're talking 16,000 feet or something, but still. The difficulty of being accurate brought about a change in Bomber Command's tactics. I can see why. I can see why. Trying to pinpoint one factory and we're going to blow the doors off that factory. That's never going to happen because we can't get within five miles. The only way to deal with this job is bomb the whole city, carpet bomb the place. After 14 attempts, Guy's finally zeroing in on the target. Close, but no cigar, really. It had to be within the box to be classed as a hit. So I'm going to try and build up a bit of suspense now and add to the last one. Right, so now I know what I need to do. I need to see the towers, right? Count one, two, and a bit, and then drop one, drop the other. The final run is left best described by a World War II Lancaster crew. OK, and now we're over the lake now. Arm doors open. Seven, Okay. Steady. Steady. Bombs away. There goes the cookie. Okay, okay, okay. Direct hit. Direct hit. First one, miss. Second one, on the money. Inside the box. That was a direct hit over the target, by the look of it. Yeah. OK. Great. We got it. Fantastic. Well done, guys. Well done, thank you. Well done, mate. Well done. Would I have been volunteering in Bomber Command? Probably. Was I clever enough? Probably not. What would I have been doing? I'd have probably been T-boy or I'd have been ground crew. But what would I want to be? What would I want to be? Rear gunner. I'd be tailing Charlie by getting dragged off of Germany backwards. Yeah. What a job. <laughs>